Hello viewers and a very warm welcome to the Question Hour show from the Parliament House Complex, the show where we bring you important unstart questions asked by the members of the Upper House in the previous sessions of the Rajya Sabha and the replies given by the government. I'm Kriti Mishra and joining me is my colleague Rajat K. Well, thanks Kriti and thanks to your viewers for watching this edition of Question Hour. Well, Rajat, you know Question Hour is a very important tool in India's parliamentary democracy. It gives an opportunity to members of both Houses of Parliament, Rajya Sabha as well as Lok Sabha, to seek answers from the government as ministers are collectively accountable or responsible. There are different types of questions, the start questions, the unstart ones and also the short notice ones. Now start questions are those questions of which replies are given orally on the floor of the house by concerned ministers. Meanwhile the other category is the unstart where detailed replies are given by the ministries and departments at the end of the proceedings of the day and in this show in Raj Sabha TV we get you all the details from the unstart questions asked by the members and replies given by the ministers and head of departments. So Rajat, let's begin the show. Well, the first question of the show was asked by member G.C. Chandrasekhar from Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. The member asked about the measures adopted to deal with high carbon emission in the country especially in the urban areas. And giving a detailed reply to this question asked by member G.C. Chandrasekhar, the government says that despite having no binding obligation under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, India announced its voluntary goal to reduce the emission intensity of its GDP by 20 to 25 percent by 2020 in comparison to 2005 levels. Under the Paris Agreement of Climate Change, India submitted its nationally determined contribution, which is NDC, to the UN FCCC, outlining eight targets for the period 2021 to the period 2030. One of the targets under NDC is to reduce the emission intensity of GDP by 33 to 35 percent by 2030 from the 2005 level. The government is implementing National Action Plan on Climate Change, which provides an overarching policy framework for all climate actions. And NAPCC comprises of eight core missions, including a specific national mission on sustainable habitat that includes schemes and programs to promote energy efficiency in buildings, management of solid waste and model shift of public transport. 33 states and UTs have also prepared state action plan on climate change consistent with the objectives of national action on climate change. As per India's second biennial update report submitted to the United Nations Framework on Climate Change in December 2018, emissions intensity of India's GDP has decreased by 21% in 2014 as compared to the 2005 levels. And joining us on the question our show is Rajya Sabha MP Mr. D.C. Chandrasekhar. Mr. Chandrasekhar, welcome to Rajya Sabha TV and thank you so much for joining us through this virtual platform. So as you know, our show focuses on all the important unstart questions asked by the members of the Upper House and talking about the last session, you asked a very pertinent question on carbon emissions in the country and the steps taken by the government to reduce the emissions. A very important issue, sir. See, this is the most important uh, question which I asked to the government. See, this is according to the report of the Global Alliance on Health and Pollution, GAHP. Only by pollution causes more than 2 million deaths per year in India. So how dangerous you see this? According to WHO report, due to the pollution, 23 lakh premature deaths per year. Out of which air pollution alone kills around you know 12.4 lakh prematures. See this is you can imagine. See this is how this pollution is you know uh, causing for deaths and all. So reduce this emission density at its GDP by 33 to 35 percent by 20 to 30, 2030 from 2005 level, the government is implementing a national action plan on climate change. But they have to work on this very seriously, otherwise it will not going to materialize. This is most important thing. According to the international agency, energy agency, India's annual fuel consumption is 20, in 2020 is more than 5 million barrels per day and also more than 30 crores vehicles are there in India 
to produce 9% of the total pollution. So just imagine this is how it will distinct, you know, uh, we creating the problems. So before Corona lockdown in India, carbon CO2 emission was more than 150 million tons. But after the lockdown, the emission has gone back to 30 million tons. You can imagine. So air pollution dipped by 79% during the lockdown in Delhi. For cleaning Ganga, you know that government of India has spent 20,000 crores, but they were unsuccessful. They could not see that, you know, clear water in Ganga. But due to the lockdown, water quality of Ganga, Yamuna and other polluted rivers, the quantity, the aquatic creatures have been seen clearly through the water. If it is, you know, if it shows, if it disturbs the nature, nature will punish us. This is my answer. Thank you, Kruti. And any specific suggestion to the government, sir? See, that's what, you know, this is, you know, if you spend money and everything is no use. See, control these things, wherever we are, you know, producing these emissions and, you know, carbon, that is, you know, how to reduce. Otherwise, you know, not future. Even now itself, it's very difficult. If you see in Delhi, we are all there in Delhi. See, even South Indians, we have to come with a mask. Even in a normal stage also to come to Delhi. You forget about, you know, this is the Corona time. Before Corona also, we used to wear masks in Delhi because of the pollution. It went till 700. It is very difficult to leave and inside or outside. So this the thing, see, the government has to take very seriously of this. See, this is in worldwide that exports. Experts are giving a very good suggestions and also the working on this. And we have to see in other countries what they are doing, the best method. We have to follow that systems and methods and, you know, we have to save the country. We have to save the people. See, you have seen that. This is, you know, the heart attacks and the lungs related cancers and everything. This is due to the pollutions. See, that particular, particularly now, I am telling you, this is the right time to control everything. See, that's what the government has to work on this. We have to give more importance than what they are giving in a, a military, more than that they have to give this, you know, for nature also. This is my suggestion to the government. Right, sir. Absolutely. As you said, that it is very important to focus on health and the health issues related to pollution and high carbon emission. But on that note, thank you so much for joining us and speaking to Ratsapa Television, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Kruti. Thank you very much. Well, on that note, thank you so much for joining us and speaking to Rajya Sabha TV. And let's move on to the next question asked by member Sukram Singh Yadav. And this question pertains to the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. And the member has asked the government whether guidelines issued by Centre for Compliance for respective state governments towards prevention of burning of crop residues for farmers in the agriculture fields and to what extent the pollution level has increased in the various cities due to crop residue burning and also the steps taken by the government to reduce this. Well, giving a detailed reply to the query, the ministry said that the steps taken by the government towards prevention of burning of crop residues by farmers in the agricultural field includes a central sector scheme on promotion of agricultural mechanization for in situ management of crop residue in the states of Punjab, Haryana, Uttar Pradesh and the NCT of Delhi administered by Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare with an outgo of central funds of rupees. 1178.47 crore during 2018 and 20 for the following components. Now these has 100% central share. First, farm machinery banks for customs hiring of in situ crops residue management machinery with financial assistance of 80% of the project cost through cooperative societies of farmers, farmers, producers, organizations, self-help groups, registered farmer societies, farmers groups, private entrepreneurs, group of women farmers or self-help groups for establishing of farm machinery bank or customs hiring uh, centers of in-situ crop residue management machinery. Now, the group of farmers and individual farmers having their own tractors, combined harvesters is preferred for establishing custom hiring center. Old established custom hiring centers with non-crop residue machinery are also eligible. Now, financial assistance to farmers for procurement of agricultural machinery and equipment for in-situ crop residue management 
at the rate of 50% of the cost of machinery and equipment is provided to farmer, individual uh, farmers for purchase of machinery and equipment for crop residue management. Now, financial assistance for mass awareness campaign activities for information, education and communication on the in-situ crop residue management is provided to state governments, KVKs, ICAR institutions, central government institutions and also the PSUs. And lastly, the SUFFER web portal that is system of air quality and weather forecasting and research of Indian Institute of Tropic Metrology, Pune, has estimated contribution in pollution level from the stubble burning between 2 to 44 percent for PM 2.5 levels in Delhi during October and November 2019. However, the estimated contribution of more than 30 percent was only for three days during this period, a reduction of about 18.8 31% in active fire incidents in Punjab, Haryana, Uttar Pradesh has been recorded in 2019 over the figures for 2018 and 17 respectively. Well, time for a very short break. More on the other side. से जूझ रहा है और गर्भवती महिलाओं को अपना खास ध्यान रखने की जरूरत है ऐसी कोई रिपोर्ट सामने नहीं आई है जो ये प्रमाण दे सके कि गर्भवती महिलाओं को कोविड 19 संक्रमण से अधिक खतरा है लेकिन कुछ पोषण संबंधित सलाहों का पालन करना बहुत जरूरी है जैसे पहले तिमाही में कम से कम तीन बार भोजन और एक छोटा नाश्ता और दूसरे व तीसरे तिमाही में तीन बार भोजन और दो छोटे नाश्ते करने जरूरी हैं। अपने दैनिक आहार में ऊर्जा देने वाले खाद्य पदार्थ जैसे अनाज बसा शारीरिक वृद्धि करने वाले खाद्य पदार्थ जैसे दूध व दूध से बनी चीजें दालें सूखे मेवे अंडा मांस मछली और सुरक्षात्मक खाद्य पदार्थ जैसे फल व सब्जियाँ लेने जरूरी है अनीमिया से बचने के लिए आयरन रिच चीजें जैसे कि हरे पतेदार सब्जियां, मांस मछली अंडा दालें व वाइटामिन सी रिच खाद्य पदार्थ जैसे कि संतरा मौसमी अमरूद खाना जरूरी है गर्भावस्था के दौरान रोजाना आयरन फोलिक एसिड और कैल्शियम की गोली खानी जरूरी है पर ध्यान रखें कि ये दोनों गोलियाँ आप साथ में ना लें दिन में कम से कम आठ से दस गिलास पानी पिए और अन्य तरल पदार्थ जैसे नींबू पानी नारियल पानी का सेवन भी जरूर करें शराब नशीली चीजें और तंबाकू से बहुत दूर रहें क्योंकि इसका आपके बच्चे पर बहुत बुरा असर पड़ सकता है रोजाना दिन में दो घंटे का आराम और आठ घंटे की नींद लेनी जरूरी है साथ ही में बीस ऐसी पच्चीस मिनट का व्यायाम या योग भी जरूर करें तला हुआ खाना और घी तेल चीनी और नमक का अपने दैनिक आहार में कम से कम इस्तेमाल करें कोविड 19 के समय में तनाव अधिक हो सकता है इसलिए ज्यादा समय अपने परिवार वाले और अपने पति के साथ बिताएं। कोविड 19 के खतरों से सतर्क रहें और आशा नंबर और हेल्पलाइन नंबर अपने पास रखें और उनके निर्देशों का पालन करें Welcome back. You're watching Question Hour. Well, moving on to the next question that was asked by member Hussein Dalwai from Ministry of Jal Shakti. The member asked whether the government maintains any data on the change in utilization of the amount of water from agriculture used to industrial use and whether it's a fact that urban areas in Maharashtra get 400% more water distribution than rural Maharashtra and what are the details of actions taken by central government as regards to this disparity and if not, what are the reasons for that thing? And this one, this question, the government says that water being a state subject, state governments allocate water for different uses as per their priorities and requirements. The state and UTY's data on the change in utilization of amount of water from agriculture to industrial use is not available. However, as per the National Commission on Integrated Water Resources Development, which was in 1999, both irrigation and industrial water demands of the country are projected to increase by the year 2050. 
the government of Maharashtra, particularly uh, since the member had questioned about Maharashtra, has informed that urban and rural areas of Maharashtra get water as per the consumption norms fixed by Maharashtra Water Resources Regulatory Authority. And as per the Maharashtra Water Resources Regulatory Authority, the applicable per capita norms for entitlement for domestic water user shall be 55 litres per capita per day for rural water supply schemes and ranges between 55 IPCD to 1 IPCD for peri-urban or urban areas. Water distribution being a state subject, actions with regard to disparity, if any, in distribution of water in urban and rural areas that is taken by the respective state governments. And let's move on to the next question asked by member Ram Kumar Verma. And this question pertains to the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. And the member has asked about the population of tigers and whether the population of tigers and cheetahs that have dropped in the last three years and the steps taken by the government to protect tigers and cheetahs in the country and the number of tigers and cheetahs that have been killed or been hunted illegally during the last three years and the details of action taken by the government. For replying in negative, the government said that the tiger population estimates have shown an increasing trend over the last four cycles of quadrilineal All India Tiger estimation, wherein 1411, 1706, 2226, and 2967 tigers have been recorded during the year 2006, 2010, 2014, and 18, respectively. The cheetah was declared extinct in India in the year 1952 and there are currently no animals in the wild in the country. The Government of India, through the National Tiger Conservation Authority, has taken several milestone initiatives for tiger conservation in the country, which include Amendment to Wildlife Protection Act 1972, strengthening the ongoing centrally sponsored scheme of Project Tiger and increasing its budgetary allocation, technological interventions, instituting annual and quadrilineal monitoring protocols, and engaging internationally through bilateral agreement engagements and fora such as CITES. Now, as reported by states, only 65 confirmed cases of tiger poaching have been recorded in the last three years, while there have been 37 cases of tiger body part seizures during the same period. The Government of India, through National Tiger Conservation Authority, has taken several measures to prevent poaching of tigers, which include raising, arming and deploying the Special Tiger Protection Force, conducting security audit of tiger reserves, preparation of security plan for tiger reserves, instituting mobile-based application of effective patrolling besides providing financial and technical assistance under the ongoing centrally sponsored scheme of Project Tiger for anticipating these measures. So, well, moving on to the next question that was asked by member B. Lingai Yadav from Ministry of Jal Shakti. The member asked whether some states have sought relaxation in the central norms for financial support to drinking water supply projects in the habitations affected by fluoride and salinity and whether some states have requested the central assistance should be provided in totality in order to create basic infrastructure for polluted water regions. If so, what are the details? And responding to this query, the government says that few states like Rajasthan had requested for relaxation in fund sharing patterns so as to reduce the financial burden on the state in the form of state share in the rural water supply projects catering to water quality affected inhabitations. Further, several states have been requesting for increased central assistance for creating drinking water infrastructure in various uh, levels at different points in time. The government further says that uh, keeping in view all these, Government of India in partnership with the states has launched Jal Jeevan mission to enable every rural household in the country to have portable water in adequate quantity of prescribed quality on a regular basis through functional household tap connection by the year 2024 with an outlay of 3.60 lakh crore. Demands raised by states affected with different water quality issues, including fluoride and salinity, were considered while firming up the modalities of implementation of Jal Jeevan Mission and accordingly, while allocating fund among states and UTs under Jal Jeevan Mission, 10% weightage is given to proportion of the population residing in water quality affected areas. Further, states have been advised to accord priority to water quality affected habitations while implementing piped water supply schemes under Jal Jeevan Mission. Further, in March 2017, to provide safe drinking water to 27,544 arsenic or fluoride affected rural habitations in the country, National Water Quality Submission was launched, which has now been subsumed under Jal Jeevan Mission. And as on 19th of March 2020, 
3,940.34 crore has been provided to arsenic and fluoride affected areas by the government. And let's move on to the next question asked by member Ronald Sapa and this question pertains to the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways. And the member has asked about the total amount of investments required for construction of bitumen pavement and reinforced cement concrete pavement respectively per kilometers in highways in the hilly regions of the country for the last 10 years and he's also asked about the action taken by the government to improve the conditions of the highways or roads in the country to make them world class. Well, replying to query, the ministry said the cost of national highways varies depending upon terrain, type of pavement, width of highways, number and length of structures, availability of materials. In hilly areas, the normative civil work cost is excluding provision of various miscellaneous items for widening to two lane with paved shoulder is 6.29 crore per kilometers. Flexible pavement as per circular issued by ministry on 25th of April 2018. However, the basic cost and additional cost is required for slope stabilization, landslide retention measures depending on site condition. The type of pavement to be adopted for national highways project is to be decided on the basis of durability, site constraints, drainage conditions, life cycle cost. Now, considering the issues related to long service life, fuel consumption, resistance to extreme weather conditions and saving of natural resource and maintenances, the rigid pavement may be more advantageous. However, if price comparison between the rigid pavement and flexible pavement is not within an accepted limit of 20%, the use of flexible pavement is are contained. Continued. Now, the national highways are designed and constructed as per standards and guidelines issued by Indian Cross Congress uh, that, or the Ministry. There are provi provisions in the contract agreements for checking quality during construction by implementing agencies and independent engineers, authority engineers. Now, further, for all constructed workers, there is minimum defect liability period within which contractors, concessionaire has to rectify the defects or repairs at his own cost. Now, contractors and concessionaires has to carry out repair work adhering to ministry's specifications and IRC codes for maintenance of pavements. Well, moving on to next question, asked by member Om Prakash Mathur from Ministry of Railways. The member asked about the provisions made at railway stations to deal with issues of disaster management and railway safety. And responding to this query, the government says that there exists an institutional framework for disaster management on Indian railways. Divisional level, zonal level and the ministry level disaster management plans have been prepared with clearly defined responsibilities and objectives. The disaster management plans have details of action to be taken in case of different types of disasters, officials to be contacted, their contact details, etc. Railway stations are provided with contact details of important railway officials under whose jurisdiction the station is located. Contact details of nearby railway and civil hospitals, district authorities and fire brigade, ambulance services, etc. are also provided at all the railway stations. Now, the government also says that multiple modes of communications are also available at the railway station to contact required officials in case of any emergency or disaster situation. The stations have also been provided with fire extinguishers, fire buckets filled with dry sand and water and first aid boxes to provide immediate relief. Indian Railways conducts in-house mock drills as well as with National Disaster Response Force or the NDRF at regular intervals to ensure preparedness and operational readiness of the disaster response teams and equipment. Staff are trained in disaster management and first aid periodically. And moving on to the last question of this edition of the Question Hour show asked by member Neerat Shekhar. And this is the question to the Minister of Jal Shakti and he has sought details about the fund allocated under Jal Jeevan Mission in the budget 2021 and also the details of fund allocated, released, utilized under Jal Jeevan Mission during 2019-20 till 1st of March 2020. Now, as per the details given by the Ministry, now, these figures are as following. Now, rural population as per the last census, 30%. Rural SCST population as per last census, 10%. Now, states under DDP, DPAP, HADP and special category hill states in terms of rural areas, 30%. Population as per DDWS, IMIS, residing in habitations affected by chemical contaminations, including heavy metals, as on 31st of March of proceedings financial year, that is 10%. Now, weightage for balanced individual household connections to be provided 20%. 
for the year 20, 2020 and 21, an amount of 11,500 crore as gross budgetary support has been allocated and rupees 12,000 crore as extra budgetary source has been proposed for Jal Jeevan Mission. Now, allocation among states is made in the beginning of financial year after budget is approved. While allocating the funds to states, 10% weightage is given to population affected with chemical contaminations uh, in the drinking water sources, which include arsenic. And lastly, the detailed state-wise central allocation, release and report utilization under Jal Jeevan Mission for the financial year 2019-20 is given in the annex shares to reply. In addition, funds have been earmarked for rural water supply and sanitation projects. Low-income states, states identified to be affected by Japanese encephalitis, acute encephalitis syndrome and national water quality submission. Well, that's it in this edition of Questionnaire. Thanks for watching Rajasabha TV.